you're saying that we need a one-payer health system. And yet we do have a one-payer health system today. It's called Medicare, basically. That is a one-payer system, basically. And we're having problems with Medicare. We're having problems with Medicare, so you want to expand that system to the non-Medicare population. You've got to fix the cost issue, or you're going to lose Medicare and your other proposal. So what do you propose to do as far as, you say I'm going to take it out of uh, profits and I'm going to take it out of um, a, a overhead that's not needed, administrative costs. Is that going to pay for all the, yes. then why can't we, why isn't we doing that in Medicare then? Okay, no, no, no. okay so the, the, there are problems with Medicare and when we say improve Medicare for all, we don't mean just taking our current Medicare and expanding it. We mean a system like Medicare, which is publicly financed, but people can choose where they want to go to see the doctor. So as I was, as I was saying, yeah, Medicare in some ways, their problems, they're multifold. I mean, it's not just a single payer system because we have Medicare Advantage and that eats up a lot of Medicare dollars. Um, that takes, you know, 14% more than our traditional Medicare. But that's coming out of the Obama plan down the road, right? The Advantage? I think, it, yeah, they're trying to address okay, that. Okay, so dig that out. So, um, the, if you have, so Medicare's problems are, are so largely due to the fact that our health care costs are expanding uncontrollably. So how do we get those health care costs under control? The Affordable Care Act has not employed any proven cost control mechanisms. They're all experimental. And some of them have been tried in various forms before. Like the ACOs are really kind of another reiteration of the, or iteration of the MCOs or HMOs. And, and those haven't worked. So under a Medicare for All system, we have the administrative savings. So you're going down to from 33% to about 3%. Yeah, you have stay in Medicare, though. You've got 3% in Medicare. Right. right. So, in a national Medicare system, but the, if you go on our website, this is a very simple answer. If you go to our website, there have been multiple studies done by the General Accounting Office and the Congressional Budget Office, as well as state uh, level studies done that have proven over and over that we can control health care costs most effectively. Actually, it's the only one that controls health care costs with a single payer system. Actually, that happened in Kansas. Did you guys know that there was a study, um, Kathleen Sebelius had it um, when she was governor, that looked at five different systems, and the only one that controlled health care costs was the single payer system. Um, but I urge you to go to our website and learn more there. We're talking about improving Medicare and expanding it. Okay, thank you. I'd like to get down to some other specifics of this area. In addition to the tendencies to reduce cost overhead and administration for some of the other areas you've already described, Another aspect of this complex problem that needs to be addressed is, the, is that of utilization. Mm -hmm. uh, what we have right now is a tendency toward oversupply and maldistribution of technology, specialties, and overutilization. Right. There have in the past been various attempts to try to control these. Uh, one of the noted examples was the principal utilization review. Mm -hmm. You've also asserted that one of the reasons that you've gotten into this is to be able to practice medicine as you saw fit, as opposed to having someone else telling you how you may or may not practice medicine. Could you reconcile for me, what are some of the ways you would address in terms of a utilization review or other type of approach uh, that would have more appropriate utilization in order to reduce cost? Thank you, that's a, a great question. So yeah, we, in the United States, we have people that are overtreated, people that are undertreated, and people that are mistreated. <laughs> um, it's really striking to me, you know, when I did my training, um, we were very reluctant to do a test on a patient. Well, it's pediatrics for the first thing, so you really don't want to do unnecessary tests on children because they don't usually like to have tests done. But we took a lot of pride in being able to do most of our diagnosis using a good history and physical exam and then sometimes using tests to verify that or sort out if you really weren't quite sure what was going on. What I'm hearing now is that doctors are spending so little time with their patients that they're just much more likely to go in to do procedures. And I think there was actually just a study that came out today that, that verified that. Um, also, we're paid for doing procedures. We're not paid for spending time with our patients and, and really you know, seeing what medications they're on, doing a detailed history. So um, under a single-payer system, now where doctors are able to 
this is the, the goal, <laughs> to spend more time with their patients, um, hopefully that would start to correct some of that. Also, we don't have this kind of long-term relationship that, that we used to have with patients staying with their physician for a long period of time. There's a lot more change back and forth because of changing insurance, changing jobs, things like that. Um, so I think part of it is restoring that, that physician-patient physician relationship. Um, part of it is taking the profit out and hospitals not having to push on their doctors to do more and more procedures. We see that happening. Um, part of it is good health planning. You know, if, if hospital A in a city gets a new tech, you know, piece of technology and they start marketing that and drawing a lot of patients, then hospital B over here says, oh, we got to compete. We've got to get that machine too. And, and that's not a good use of our healthcare dollars. And it's also not good for the patients. Because if we did good planning so that one hospital was really good at cardiac hospital, we know that the more that you know, um, a center sees a particular type of patient, the better they get at it, the more efficient, the lower cost, and the better, better outcomes that they have. They become like a center of excellence. In my viewpoint, I'm sorry I'm going on too long, is that we need two things to turn ourselves around. We need a system that prioritizes health. We need the money to pay for that. That's what single payer does. Beyond that, we have a lot to do. But that at least sets us on the right track. One of the... Uh one of the uh, yeah, one of the op the yeah, one of the messages from the opposition is that it's caused by patients suing doctors. That it's liability that's crushing the system. Can you address that? Yeah, um, medical malpractice in this in this country is a problem. It's not a huge driver of our health care costs, but it's hard to measure how much that drives us to do unnecessary tests. That definitely happens. About 50% of malpractice cases are due to ongoing medical costs. So if somebody has a bad outcome, they know they're going to have ongoing, need ongoing care, they sue to get the money to pay for that. Well, under a single-payer system, you don't have to worry about that anymore. If you have a bad outcome, you're going to get the care that you need. And bad outcomes happen. I mean, we just statistically, you know that for every hundred of this procedure, there's going to be a certain number of people that have a bad outcome. It's just how it is. So, um, so that driver would be taken away. And then again, I think as we get more into building up our primary care force, having doctors be able to spend more time with their patient, restoring that trust, our trust levels are just really low, that that will go a long way as well to address the malpractice problem. But there are also proven ways. I mean, like Canada went to a national malpractice and they cut their costs down, uh, way down. Now, there's a main challenge that's often given So, you know, what do we do if now everybody has access to health care? They're just going to go wild and want all kinds of tests and things. Um, um, I mean, one answer is, is that most people aren't really out to get a lot of health care treatment. I mean, there are some people who thrive on that, um, but most of us don't. We just really want to get the care that we need. The other is that there's always a finite set of resources, so you can't just infinitely expand what health care services get because they have to fit within the finite amount of healthcare that we can deliver. So what we see in countries that create a system, you know, like what we saw in Taiwan, is that there's a shift in who's getting care. So that more of the people that needed care and weren't getting it are now getting care, and more of the people that were getting too much care and didn't really need it are getting less care. So as you see a shift in, in who's getting care. But I'm more concerned about the fact that people are not getting treatment in here than, than in this country, than the people that are getting too much. I think we really have to start making our first priority to make sure that everybody can get the care they need. You know, it, it's just staggering. I mean, Two million people in the United States every year are diagnosed with cancer and can't get the treatment that they need. I've met people in airports that have chosen, you know, older adults who have had cancer, who have chosen not to get treatment so that they either don't bankrupt their family or their children can go to college. Mm -hmm. yeah. So they're, they're, they're like committing suicide so that their family doesn't, isn't left destitute. Um, it's just wrong. I'd like to ask you, uh, ideally it sounds lovely, mm -hmm. but the practical implementation of it, where do you start? Does your organization have a, a plan, a step-by-step -step plan 
who will start it, uh, what will we dismantle, and what we will put in place of it, and how will it affect the states? Will it be a, uh, a, a federally uh, mandated uh, uh, program, or will the states play a part in it? Uh, those are the things that I, th I right. think I'd like to know. And I'm t uh, if it's too involved, if you've got it on your website, I'll be happy to read it. There is some information on the website. Um, so I meant to say, and I didn't, that, that already 60% of our health care is publicly funded, comes from public dollars. So we need to make that other 40% up. That we've done through a small increase in a federal tax, it's not a state tax, but a federal tax, um, which would be, at, people would be spending less through this tax than we're currently spending for premiums and out-of-pocket costs. Um, so we think that that's probably pretty acceptable. Um, we have kind of a national framework already through Medicare for administration, but we can. what we're planning to do is make it more regionally um, uh, administered so that there's better knowledge of what the resources and needs are in that region. Um, and we have like a two-year transition period for workers to have worker support as they transition out of these administrative jobs that would be lost. Um, you know, it can be done. Medicare in this country was started in 1965 in an age when we didn't have computers, and they, they did it in one year. <laughs> and it's been done in other countries, you know, very quickly. In Taiwan, they did an 18-month planning period, and they said, on this day we start, and on that day, everybody had coverage. Anybody who presented for care got care. So we can do this.